And that somehow, when you're in a home and somebody loses their temper, chaos takes place. Maybe you've been married to somebody like that, or maybe you are married to somebody like that. And you don't want to admit it because you think everything is wonderful at the house. But anger can cause all kinds of devastation. Sometimes anger can ruin relationships. Sometimes even getting mad at ourselves can ruin our perception of what God wants us to do. So today we're going to have a very practical sermon for probably 85% of you. And some of you guys show anger in different ways. Uh, and we're going to be talking about that as well. So let me read our scripture and we're going to talk uh, a very biblical principle on our anger. So it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give a place for the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as Christ, for God's sake, has forgiven you. There's anger in our lives. Um, and I, I, I'm going to be transparent because I, I, I know that you guys think that I'm the calm, nice, easygoing person that never loses his temper. Well, and the, the, I, I hope you would think that, but that would be a total misjustice. I'm going to share a couple of illustrations about my anger. A few years ago, um, there was times where I would lose my temper. And in most cases, it all revolved around athletics, basketball, or baseball. And I had to quit playing basketball, and I had to quit coaching basketball because I would get mad. And we have some of the basketball team that goes to our church here that I used to coach. And um, there was a day that uh, we were playing for the MAYB championship, and uh, uh, I was refing. We were tied with five seconds left to go in the game. And Bryce Haight, that's a member of our church, stole the ball and went up for a layup, and he was killed, hammered, onto the ground. There was no call. This, this is junior high, high school basketball now, okay? So I was the coach. I pulled the Bob Knight, okay? I was so livid, I got up in that referee's face, and he was about this tall. And I said a few words to him. I wasn't Pastor Bruce. I was Coach Bruce, not Pastor Bruce. And uh, uh, he got back in my face. I said, do you want to just take this outside? This is on a Sunday afternoon, folks. <laughs> I just preached an hour and a half ahead of time. And uh, we got in each other's face, and, all, and, I, and I, I felt so bad. I just lost my temper. And the bad thing is, all these high school students were right behind me. And they watched everything I said. My boy goes, Dad. <laughs> wow. I said, I know, I know, I know. And I resigned to the fact that uh, I can't coach. Because there's times in my life I cannot control my temper. Somebody give me an amen. amen. You guys can come up here and tell your same stories, right? If you, if you had enough guts to do that. But that's all right. Um, worse one than that. I took a mission trip to Missouri, uh, Mexico. <laughs> and then they had a basketball over here. And so I was playing, my team was playing basketball with the, the Mexicans and they, we were just interacting. I was coaching. I was coaching. And uh, this big Mexican dude, he just dogged one of my boys. And I told him, I said, man, you can't play basketball like that. So the missionary got mad at me for telling his kid that he can't do that. So the missionary, we got in a fight on the sideline between the missionary and the pastor in front of all of our kids. <laughs> to a point that he pushed me. And guess what I did? I pushed him back. We were going to go do evangelism in about two hours. <laughs> but I lost my temper. And then I was playing golf with Pastor Al one day. And uh, 
Al, Al has a hard time. He, he hits the ball and it always goes to the right and it goes into the woods or the water. Every time. So his son was with me and I, I said, I said, I said, why does your dad do that? He goes, he goes, he's been doing that all his life. I said, what's he do when he does that? He goes, he goes, I, I, I can show you. And he takes a club out of Pastor Al's bag and he throws it in the water. That's what my dad taught me how to control my anger. Instead of getting mad at somebody, just throw my club in the water. And that's what Pastor Al does. If you play golf with him, you know that. He has to buy new clubs every year or so. And then sometimes we just get mad at ourselves, don't we? I was playing golf with Pastor Al. This is a true story. That one wasn't. But this was a true story. We were on a par five. I had my five iron out. And I duck hooked that thing out of bounds. Pastor, I'll stand up. Show, show them what I did to my five iron. Yeah. I may have kissed it, but I broke it over my knee and I threw it over the fence. And you know what I learned? I am very, very weak when it comes to anger. There's a time in my life where the anger turns into the Hulk. And it may be about somebody else. And it may be about what I have done. But there's times in our lives that anger controls us. And the Bible says we can be angry and not sin. What I want to teach us today is anger is a natural process and it's a natural emotion. But what we do in our emotion, in our anger, is very important. So let me give you six things, and I want to give you a wrap-up. The bulletin's long, but it's really good information. This is an anger management seminar. Okay, so the first one is anger is a normal emotion. Anger is a God-given emotion if it's handled correctly. Jesus got mad, but he did not sin. There's three translations. In the NIV it says, in your anger, do not sin. In the RSV it says, be angry but do not sin. In the King James it says, be ye angry and sin not. The Bible tells us that we are going to get angry. We're going to lose our temper. We're going to be frustrated in a lot of areas. But what we have to do is we have to understand what our anger triggers are and flip the switch. Anger management would tell you this. And we all, if you've been in any of my classes, you know I say this all the time. It's kind of like when they go to the city pool and you have the slipper slide. You know what that is? You go up about 12 steps, you go down, you, you go into the water. Oh, it's fun when we do that. Anger management is this. There's 12 steps to that slipper slide. And sometimes when we get mad, we remember going one, two, or three steps. But all of a sudden, we turn into the Hulk. We don't remember taking 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and go down. We take our three steps and we have lost it. We are so stinking mad that I don't care what anybody says. I don't care who's around. I'm going to say what I want to say. I want to do what I want to do. And I don't care what you think. And all of a sudden, we're down that slide without even remembering what last steps were. And we do not care what we say who we say it around and what we do, we are mad because I was wrong. And then we fall in that water. And then we think about what I just said. And then we have regret and remorse because of what I said. At the moment, I did not care. But after I think about it, I should have cared. What we have to do is we have to understand anger is, could be healthy. And it could be devastating. What is some healthy anger? And that natural emotion. Well, hey, healthy anger is is like Lori. I tried to shoot a basketball. And if she was playing for the state championship and she did this this year and she scored what two points and out of the minute? Oh four, I'm sorry, four points. <laughs> if she was playing for the state championship this year and she scored four points this year, the anger inside of her says, I'm gonna get better. I'm not going to lose my temper. I'm not going to get mad at the referee. I'm not going to get mad at the coach. I need to be frustrated with myself. And I am going to get better at what I'm doing. That's good anger. Here's another good anger. When somebody goes against God's word, 
Somebody harms God's testimony. We can be righteous indignation. We can get frustrated because they are harming God's testimony or what God wants for us. There should be some righteous indignation. But even in our righteous indignation, we can never hurt somebody. We can pray for them. We can encourage them. But we never have a right to hurt somebody. So, uh, Aristotle said this. Anybody can become angry. But to be angry with the right person, to the right degree, at the right time, for the right purpose, and in the right way. This is not within everybody's power. It's about your maturity of how you handle life. So we need to understand that anger can be a natural reaction. And it could be a good thing. Here's a warning sign. Anger is a warning light built in by God. Sometimes we know when things are going to tick us off. We understand it. In verse 26 it says, In your anger, do not sin. We're going to get mad. But when we get mad, we need to make sure that we do not sin. And how do we understand we do not sin? We have to understand. It, it, uh, Benjamin Franklin said it this way. He said, A pot with a little bit of water in it boils faster than a pot that's full of water. What that means is sometimes if we let our anger control us, we can boil very quickly. And when we do not have our testimony, we don't have our life, sometimes our life or our, our frustration is set up so quick that we can blow up and we can boil very quickly. And when we boil, it hurts. We do not like it. We can get into trouble when we ignore the signs of anger. When we ignore the warning lights of anger. Um, it, <laughs> I, I have a terrible habit of not getting gas in my car. Anybody had that problem? And, and the warning light, low fuel, low fuel. You know what? I can bake it. I, I, I can make it to the next gas station. Well, I usually can. But about four years ago, the light came on. Low fuel, low fuel, low fuel. And I was running late for a wedding. I had my blue suit on, my red tie. I was going to this wedding and I was running late. I got a mile from the destination of the Botanical Gardens. I got a mile away from there and my car died. Here I am, the preacher, with my notes in my walking that 30, that, that 10 minutes to the botanical gardens. Nobody stopped picking me up. I think they, they, they would, but they didn't. So what I did is I did not trust the warning light. The makers of that car put the warning light in there to say, you have about, what, five miles, 10 miles, maybe 15 miles before you run out of gas. But I thought, I know more than them. I know how far my car can make it, and it doesn't. And I believe God puts into our life triggers, warning lights to say, you need to stop. You need to fill up your tank. You need to calm down. Because anger can be a learned behavior that can blow up anywhere at any time. Anybody like the History Channel? I love watching History History and the Weather Channel. It's and Food Network, I guess. Um, here, I'm just rattling here. The, we the History Channel in a documentary about two weeks ago on France and the bombs that were dropped by the Allies into France and how many bombs are covered up by sand and dirt that did not explode during the drop and during the raids. And they're un un uncovering all these uh, bombs and these bombs over the years have decayed and are very fragile. And sometimes because of somebody touching it or messing with it or moving it, these bombs can explode with very little without very little uh, problems. And that is the exact same way that our anger is as well. Sometimes our anger can lay dormant for a while until somebody or something touches it and moves it and sets it off. And the person that set you off wasn't the problem. The problem was, was issues problems or things that took place in your life that this person had nothing to do with 
but it absolutely destroyed your relationship. So sometimes we have to understand that anger has triggers. And the only way that we're going to understand that what we need to do is be angry and sin not is to understand there are some issues that we have to deal with. And as warning signs, as the light flashes, as the anger rises, we have to say, Bruce, stop. Calm down. You can't do this. Number three is anger must be resolved. The verse 26 says, do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. That means I'm going to be up all night long, okay? But in other words, don't let time pass. If you're angry, if you're frustrated, what we have to do is we have to identify why I'm frustrated, and I have to deal with it. Whether I'm mad at myself or mad at somebody else, sometimes we just have to understand anger must be resolved. Anger could be a healthy emotion, it's also designed to fix a permanent emotion. When Jesus became angry in the temple, you remember that? He, it, the, 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 the priests were bringing and, and cattle and goats to be sacrificed. So the priests would take this dove and they would jack that price up to that dove so astronomical that they couldn't even afford it. And they would take that money so they could not sacrifice properly. And Jesus was angry, not at the priest, but what the priests were doing. They were stealing from people that they came to the temple to worship. They came to the temple to sacrifice. In the Old, temp in the Old Testament, they would, they would sacrifice an animal. They would pass that blood over the temple, over the altar, and their, their sins would be pushed back for another year until they came back to the temple. And Jesus came up and he saw these people, normal people, that could not sacrifice because they didn't have the resources to pay for what these astronomical prices were. So when Jesus saw what they were doing, he was angered because people of God were trying to do what they wanted to do, what God has asked them to do. And the religious leaders, the priests, were keeping them away from financial gain. Jesus got ticked. But what Jesus did, he built a whip and he knocked over the money exchange tables, but he never touched an individual. But here's what it says, right at the end. He says he did that. He cleaned out the temple. And then he turned his heart and he started healing the lame and healing individuals. He didn't allow the anger to control him over the day or over the week. He was angry. He did what he needed to do to bring a point that I want to honor God in every aspect of my life. And then he was angry. He proved his point. And then he healed individuals. Sometimes we get angry and the whole world is falling apart for the next two or three days. Somebody give me an amen. When you get angry, you set sour and soap and you're not happy. It must be resolved. But he said this in the temple. Sometimes the temple or the church is a place where a lot of things take place. It is said that uh, when a woman gets mad, loses her temper... Her blood pressure raises six points. When a man gets mad, his blood pressure goes up 14 points. Because men do not handle anger very well. There's a lot of ways that we establish it, but sometimes our anger controls us. And what we must do is we must understand emotion can control us, but we have the ability to control our emotions. You've heard this many times but it's like you and your wife are having a knockdown drag out. You're fighting, mad at each other. She burnt the, the, the dinner and you were hungry. And you guys just got the knockdown drag out. You have caller ID and the phone rings and it's Pastor Bruce. And you're yelling at each other and then you answer the phone, hello, how are you talking today? You can control your anger. You have to be mature enough to understand I have to control my anger. It has a need within my life. And sometimes if I would be so honest, sometimes we're so immature in our emotions that we allow our anger to control us and what we're doing is we're saying, Satan, you control my life. You control my issues. The fourth thing is unresolved anger is an invitation for evil. 
Verse 27 says this. And do not give the place, do not give the devil a foothold. Who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. Verse 27. And do not give a place a foothold to the devil. Foothold. There's two words that we can go with. Foothold. It's, it's in a term of, of control, of I'm, I'm, I'm dealing into, I got a foothold. And you're not going to push me back. And sometimes when we give Satan a foothold, we're saying, Satan, you're controlling me. You are allowing, um, you're allowing your influence to control my life. And we cannot give Satan a foothold. And anger is one of the easiest emotions that, that Satan gives to us. And he says, I oh, don't worry about it. Everybody gets mad. Everybody gets frustrated. But once he gets a foothold in our life, it's easy to say, that's just who I am. I just get mad. That's just what I do. No, that's sin. Let's call it what it is. Anger misused is a sin. Hurting somebody because you're mad is a sin. And if we are childlike followers of Jesus Christ, we have to understand if anger, the way I express my anger is a sin, the way I hurt other people because I'm angry is a sin, we must do something about it. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 17. A quick-tempered man does foolish things. All those women should say, Amen. Amen. It is a true thing. In Proverbs 29, 22. A hot-tempered person starts fights and gets into all kinds of sin. Hot-tempered I, 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 I was hot, I'm not anymore, but I was hot tempered. I would get upset very easily. Have you ever heard the story of the first murder in the Bible? Cain and Abel. They brought a sacrifice to God. But God accepted Abel's offering of animal. He denied Cain's offering. And Cain was upset. He got mad. And this is what God said to Cain. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at the door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. God told Cain, that if you do not master your anger, it will control you. I do not believe Cain set out that morning, I'm going to kill Abel. No, but when he got mad, he turned into the Hulk and things took place. It's a devil. And he wants us to be destroyed. And he wants you to be destroyed. When anger gets a hold of your life, it is prone to do whatever it wants to do. And you could care less what anybody else says to you. Anger controls us. Sometimes we th say things that we should not say. We do things that we should not do because we feel it's right. Anger happens mostly when we have been offended or when we feel like we have been abused. Sometimes I'm not getting my way, so I get frustrated. And anger is one of the terms of, of intimidation because who wants to fight with an angry person? Who wants to, if I if I get to this level, I have to get to this level, and it just gets wicked. We say things we should not say, we do things that we should not do because of our anger. Number five, unresolved anger is lethal when molded into words. It got quiet, didn't it? It's very easy to say stupid things, hurtful things. Because the person that we love the one that we know most about can do things and say things that I could just say something right back and it could harm, it could hurt. And if I use my words to hurt, it's devastating into the relationship. Verse 29, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Quick and careless words cause more damage than anything else. You talk to a teenager, you talk to a kid, 
and you're negative to them and you slam on them and you yell at them and they never do anything positive. Those kids are going to grow up thinking they're worthless because of your anger, because you had a bad day. There's so many marriages that are falling apart because of anger in the relationship. Instead of talking it out, instead of just sharing, somebody gets upset and they just blast at each other. They blow up, they throw that hand grenade into that relationship and they walk away. Whatever happens, happens. And they come back later to make sure everything's okay. And they cause damage into the relationship because they're mad. They didn't realize what they have done. It is lethal when words get into that relationship. And when anger takes place and we have the right to say whatever we want to say, I could care less who I say it to. I don't care how it makes anybody feel. It is sin to cause harm in a relationship because of your anger. And that's maturity to say, you know what, I should stop. I should think about what I'm doing. And unresolved anger distances us from God. The verse says in verse 30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whom you were, were sealed for the day of redemption. Let me put it this way. The Holy Spirit lives in each and every one of us if you give your life to Christ. The day that you accepted Jesus, that He died on the cross for your sins, you've accepted Him as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and takes residence within your life. And you have the power of the Holy Spirit. But here's the problem. When you ignore the Holy Spirit, when you say anger is sin, but I don't care, when you say, I can say whatever I want to say, and the Holy Spirit is saying, you can't do that. I want you to honor me within your life. And you say, I don't want to do that. You still have the Holy Spirit within your life, but the Holy Spirit doesn't have power within your life, and you cannot give what God hasn't given to you. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like a piano player. The piano player comes in, and he says, I've never played the piano before. And, he's, and the teacher says, okay, we'll start. For the first four months, he's done great. He, he's done a wonderful job on the piano. But then baseball season started. And since baseball season started, he stopped practicing on the piano. He loved baseball. And his mom and his dad says, you need to practice. You need to. Oh, yeah, I'll practice. I'll practice. I'll practice. But he goes back every week, and the piano teacher started looking at it and said, you have not grown in your piano playing for the last three months. Oh, I want to play the piano. I want to, I want to, he said, okay, I'll, this, this month I want you to practice these chords. He comes back a month later and he didn't get the chords. The piano teacher says, you know, I really don't think that you really want to do this. Oh, I do. I do. I do. And then the piano teacher says this, why don't you come back when you get these chords? I'm still your teacher, but I, until you desire to learn, I cannot make you learn. And that's the exact same thing the Holy Spirit does within our life. He is present, but He wants us to say, I want to fulfill the power of the Holy Spirit within your life. And when the power of the Holy Spirit, when you, when you say, you know what, I've got issues, and I've got anger issues, and I cannot hurt my testimony because of my anger. But sometimes we do. And we do stupid things and sometimes it's harmful. So let me share with you three ways to be good and angry. Three ways. Examine yourself. The only way you will ever know if an anger problem in your life is you start a self-examination. Self-examination. Um, many of us go to the doctor. Oh, I've been going to the doctor a lot lately. Self-examination is what the doctor would do to you. Take a look at it. And if we had physical problems... And we knew that we had physical problems. It would be very wise for us to go to the doctor and get the exam and to make sure everything's okay. Well, we're also going to take a spiritual examination. How do I express my anger? Psychologists have identified four basic ways to learn and to express our anger. Let me figure out which one you are. And you can tell yourself which one you are. And your spouse or your, your kids can tell you which one you are. The first one is the maniac. The exploder. Oh, God, quiet. No, not, not me. Uh, not me. Not me. He is the exploder. He's the one that gets mad and blows up, throws that hand grenade into the house, and can care less who it hurts. He's just the exploder. Then he goes, he gets away, 30 minutes later he comes back. He can care less what took place at the moment. But then he comes back and then he's nice because he realized he was wrong. An exploder. Or the mute. 
If the other one is exploder, this is the imploder. Okay? The imploder. This is the person who is determined never to get angry. Instead of expressing healthy anger, he or she bottles it up inside and pretends nothing ever has happened. Someone said, when I learned to swallow my anger, I later realized my stomach kept counting. Because you can't keep on swallowing your anger and not cause problems within your body. It is the cause of so much depression and anxiety within our life because I was angry. And instead of expressing communication, I expressed it by just, I don't want anybody not like me. I want everybody to be nice. And you get so mad that you're the imploder. Or what about the martyr? <laughs> the Eeyore. This person who is excellent in throwing pity parties. They secretly enjoy being disappointed and feel uncomfortable when things are going well. Their anger is repressed and later manifests itself into depression. Now, the martyr. He walks around. He wants everybody to know that he's been hurt. He, 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 he wants everybody to know. And in our society today, it's called Facebook, right? <laughs> Somebody say, I've been hurt. I've been, I've been ditched on. So uh, the martyr, the inflictor, is like an Eeyore. And the fourth is the manipulator. This is the passive-aggressive personality. Lee Iacocca, he, was a, he founded Ford, said, I don't get mad, I get even. When somebody hurt me, I'm using my anger, and I'm going to make you pay. And they do everything they can to cause havoc in people's lives. Ask what kind of person do you really want to be? Do you want to be somebody that hurts others? Or do you want to be somebody that honors others? And then the second thing is stop and think. When you find yourself in a situation that could cause you to lose your temper, you need to ask these three questions. These are very important. If you have notes, you need to write these down. First is, why? Why am I angry? Did that person try to hurt me? Is it something that somebody happened to me in my previous marriage or with my kids? Is it me? Why? Why am I angry? Sometimes the reason is not so obvious. It lies deep underneath the surface. Anger is not always the root problem, but symptoms of a bigger problem. And men, we express our emotion primarily with anger. We, we just get frustrated and and there's all kinds of emotions that go within us, but our first and easiest emotion that we express is anger. We just get frustrated. When the issues cause an overreaction, you might be dealing with residual anger of other issues that has not been resolved. A husband and wife, they could be married for 10, 15 years, and they have all these arguments, but they do not communicate about those arguments. They just... Sweep them under the rug. Sweep them under the rug. Guess what happens sooner or later? That rug's going to come up. And when that rug comes up, the fight is on. Right? We would call that reruns. We fight over the same thing over and over and over and over again until we resolve the conflict. How do you resolve the conflict? You have to ask the question, why am I angry? And then here's how you resolve that is honestly, with a pure heart, not trying to hurt the other person, but sit down and talk. That's a, that's a concept, isn't it? Sit down with maturity and talk. The second question is, is it really worth getting angry about? Is it going to change my life? Is what I'm angry about going to fix anything? Not everything that a brother says to you or a sister says to you or a wife says to you or a husband says to you is worth expressing in anger. Sometimes what we do not like is because somebody is calling us out on a sin or an issue within our life that we need to hear, but we don't want to hear. Because somebody says something to us that we don't want to hear, we get mad because all they're trying to do is help us and fix us, but we don't want to hear it. So we get mad, and we get mad enough, they will shut up. They'll leave me alone, and I can do my own thing, but sometimes we need to be called out. Is it worth getting angry about? And the third is, why do I really want, what do I really want out of this encounter? Do I want this relationship to work? 
or do I want to end this relationship? And sometimes we express our anger because we are mad at the person. If I get mad enough, he'll get mad enough and he'll leave me alone or she'll leave me alone. And we get so frustrated. What we must do is we must ask, what do I want out of this thing? Do I want to ruin what I have or do I want to fix what I have? When people think through logically what the situation is, sometimes they take some ideas. And that's why I think texting is so great. I cannot tell you how many times at night I write this two-page text about everything I hate about somebody, everything they've done wrong, and then I do not send it. And then I read it the next morning, and I said, thank God I didn't send it. Anybody like that? Sometimes it's getting something out. But sometimes getting it out of you, you don't need to get it in them. Sometimes we have such a volatile mindset of our emotions that we get so mad, we want to spew everything onto somebody else. And the problem is you, not them. And sometimes texting or emailing, but not sending, is a very good advice. And then we need to replace your anger. We need to replace your anger. Verses 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ also forgave you. How can I learn to replace anger? There's a word that we have to replace it with. It's a, it's a hard word. Many of you will never understand this, but it's so important. One word. You know what it is? Forgiveness. You're not perfect either. People get mad at you, and you get mad at others. Just as Christ has forgiven you, you must forgive others. Well, you don't know what they've done. Well, Jesus knows what you have done. And he loved you enough that he forgave you. What is the first thing that will help when you get rid of anger and forgiveness? Is we need to learn how to forgive. Forgiveness is not a natural act. Forgiveness is a very spiritual act. And we will never be able to forgive somebody until we first ask God to give us the heart of forgiveness. The power of the Holy Spirit is within you if we allow the Holy Spirit to work within you. But when we harbor anger, bitterness, and malice, and we hate that person, we don't want to talk to that person, we cannot allow the Holy Spirit of God to work within our life. But when we say, I was wrong, Lord. He said, I understand. I was too. Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. Uh, you don't know what you did to me. Because of your sin, I died on the cross. So what did they do to you? And we must understand, Jesus loved us in spite of ourselves. And we sometimes have to look at somebody. I'm not saying wink at sin. But I'm saying when we get angry, when we lose our temper, the Bible says be angry and do not sin. It's a commandment. We do not have the right to hurt somebody because of our anger. So believe that anger is a rational choice. It's a rational choice. It's a maturity process. You can get mad and you will get mad. But we have to understand there's triggers to say, not today. I am not going to allow Satan to control me today. I know he's going to use a lot of people to try to use his steps, but I am not going to allow it. To, it's a natural process to get angry. It's also a natural response to control your anger. It's a choice that we make. Look to the Holy Spirit to empower you. Confess to God that you have not expressed proper emotions and say, Lord, I need your help. I need to understand what I need to do. And then the last one is remember, Jesus forgave you. Do any of us deserve forgiveness? No. You know, the old saying is, is in theology, as long as I do more good than I do bad, I'm going to heaven. Well, that's not true. You can't do good enough to go to heaven. And you can't do bad enough to go to hell. What you must do to go to heaven is express that Jesus died on the cross and he loves you and he wants to forgive you of your sins. And when we look at that scale and put that scale on me and somebody else, I'm never going to live up to their standard. 
But what I have to live up to is God's standard. And what I must do is I must be willing to understand that anger is real. How I express my anger is no difference whether you're an Eeyore or you're a maniac. You're still expressing anger. What I must do is I say, Lord, I need you to fix me. Before I look at somebody else, before I get mad at somebody, before I don't like what they did, I must look at Jesus and say, Lord, I need you to help me. Be angry, but do not sin. Let's be angry with what God is angry about. God hates sin. He hates it. So we can be angry at sin. But you know what we must do? Love the sinner. It's hard to do. Sometimes we associate, you're a sinner, so I don't like you. Well, sinners are supposed to sin. You know what Christians are supposed to do? Is love the sinner. We can be mad at their sin, but we're called by God to love the person. And when we look at somebody and somebody angers us and somebody gets upset with what they do, what we must do is we must look past the action. Maybe call them out in a nice way. Maybe talk to them. But that person should be a subject of love that you give to them. And when we look through the lens of love, we look at the lens of, you know what? In the big picture, it's not a big deal. When we blow up and we become the Hulk, causes devastation, anger, frustration, and even chaos. Because sometimes we just don't know how to control our anger. So the challenge is very simple. I can't tell you how to control your anger. I have enough anger in my life to control, and I have a hard time even doing that. But what I know is there's only one person that can control my anger, anger and it's me. And what I must do is I must say, Lord, I need your help. I, am, uh, I sometimes have to stop doing some things that I shouldn't do. And I know right now I shouldn't coach basketball. I shouldn't referee basketball. I probably shouldn't play golf with Pastor Rath. But I mean, there's a lot of things that you just shouldn't do because of anger. But what I have to do is I have to say I have to control it. Lord, he says this, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give a place to the devil. Don't let the sin go down on your wrath. Because if you do, if you hide it, if you have bitterness, anger, and frustration within your life, and you go to sleep on it, you don't talk about it the next day, you don't even bring it up for the next month, until he does that again, and then everything that you were mad about for the month is tripled. And you get so stinking mad, you say things that you shouldn't say. But if we do what the Bible says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath because it's going to do something. It's going to do something that's more harmful than your words, more harmful than your actions. It gives a foothold, or I could say a stronghold, to Satan within your life. A stronghold is a fortified placement of the forward area of military. And when the military takes a stronghold, they cause a base. And that base is there. That enemy will not make it past that stronghold. And then after that, get that stronghold, they move into another stronghold. They move into another stronghold until they have eradicated the enemy. And Satan wants to do that within your life. He wants to take a stronghold and he wants to move within your life. And once he gets that stronghold, he's never satisfied with that stronghold. If he lets you be angry, lets you sin, lets you cuss, lets you do all kinds of different things, he said, okay, I want that one. He waits for a little while. And then he tries to take more ground. And he tries to take more ground. Then he gets into depression. Then he gets frustration. Then he gets divorced. Then he starts substance abuse. Because he wants to change your life. And sooner or later... We have to say no to the strongholds and say no longer will I allow him to take over my life and we must start fighting back the strongholds. Take over our life. Not allow Satan to control my life any longer. And it takes work. It's hard. There's not a magic pill. And coming to church on Sunday morning is not going to fix it. 
The Holy Spirit of God and your determination can say, no longer will I allow Satan to control my life, my anger, my frustration. I am going to be called by the child of God and have the Holy Spirit within my life and I'm going to allow God to work within my life and through my life to other people. And with love and compassion and the power of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, we have the ability to conquer sin and say, get behind me, Satan. But you have to do it. You can't come to church and because I come to church from 10.30 to 12 o'clock, everything's going to be great. No, that's when the battle starts. Because you're in church, Satan is mad. But the Word of God can transform our life and the Holy Spirit of God can give us the power within our life to be honest, self-aware of my issues. And as we've done the last two weeks, I'm going to ask you this. It's nobody else's business what your issues are. That's between you and God. But the way that you defeat Satan is knowing that God wants to work within your life. If you have a struggle whether it's anger or whether it's issues, whether it's relationships or maybe it's a personal issue, and you want Satan to be defeated, quit letting him have the footholds and the strongholds and say, God, with your power, the Holy Spirit, with your power, the blood of Jesus Christ has cleansed me from all of my unrighteousness. And what I need is I need victory. You will never get victory sitting in your seat. You'll never get victory coming to church. You'll get victory when you ask God for help. And that's where God can transform your life. Would you please stand to your feet? And we're going to play a song. And we're going to open these altars for you. Just to pray. Just to ask God to help you. In your feelings and your emotions and your frustrations. Allow God to work within your life. I'm going to have a word of prayer. And then we're going to open up this invitation for you. Praying to each other and for each other, to God's power. Dear Father, Lord, we do love you. And Lord, as a mature group of individuals that cause sin every day, that our emotions get the best of us, and we know that we cannot have victory over our emotions and over our anger and over our sin without your help. And Lord, this church, we do not want to give Satan stronghold in our lives within the church. So what we must do is we must ask you to help us. So today I ask you to listen to the hearts of struggling individuals, struggling marriages, struggling parenting, because we do not know how to control, and we sometimes very easily give the enemy a stronghold, and you said you do not want that. We are called by God, we are bought by the price of the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are your children, and we need you desperately today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to play this invitation song. Feel free to come down and pray and ask God to start working.